as you know it. Wide stretches of water. But this is the Pacific as the Joint Chiefs of Staff view it. A battlefield, a vast fortress-studded plain on which key strongholds anchor a Japanese defense line guarding the heart of the homeland. The American front lines had advanced to Guam and Saipan. Ahead now stood Iwo Jima, the most heavily fortified island in the world. Buried deep underground lay 20 years of Jap preparation for murder. 20,000 of their toughest fighting men waited for us to make the first move. And they don't have to wait long. The Navy begins to soften up the island so we can land. take off to strafe and bomb. to work over enemy beach installations. six days in Marine Corps history. We watch the central control vessel. When this flag drops, our landing craft will head for the beach. yards of beach. down. We want to pull the beach over our heads like a blanket. Navy 
medical corpsman get our wounded out fast. Our tanks come ashore and grind inland. from Yellow Beach, but it's slow going. into trouble on Green Beach. From their fortified positions on Mount Suribachi, the Japs look right down our throats. command ship standing offshore. Our message is received. The situation map is checked. The support air director contacts carrier planes circling the target. The flight leader receives his instructions. from the air, supporting ships deliver point-blank fire. out hidden machine gun nest. We keep a sharp lookout for snipers. Cease fire. Our guns are quiet as they make the climb. We wait for a sign. Surabachi is ours. Surabachi is ours a toehold on the southern tip of the island. But ahead, the main strength of the Jap garrison was entrenched in steel and concrete. The show was just beginning. Navy and Coast Guardsmen rushed supplies ashore for the big push north. saw 
saw Jap. But fire was coming out of every hole and every rock. Move our dead. There are heavy defenses on the ridges overlooking this plane. They draw a bead on us again. us off there five times. We came back six. We brought in our wounded and we took a breather. Injured or carried to the rear. Plasma's given on the way. Hospital dugouts are ready for anything. And we are ready to advance again. We call for artillery. develops at night. One of our ammunition dumps goes up. In two weeks, we have cleaned out plenty of Japs between here and Suribachi. But there's still a lot of island to be taken with thousands of Japs fighting from blockhouses, pillboxes, and caves. We have to go in and dig them out, one by one.
while we fought, we prayed. along the beach was only a small part of the cost of 26 days of fighting. Stacked the helmets of our dead in neat piles. Helmets of 4,000 men who died to take a tiny island somewhere in the Pacific. You're right, Marine. You've taken a tiny island. But it's not just eight square miles of rock. Today, it's an American fortress only four hours from Tokyo. Today, from your little island, Giant striking forces are launched against the heart of Japan. Today, our planes and ships are blasting the enemy into ashes at the foot of Fujiyama. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. your victories. You have a right to feel proud. Today, tomorrow, and forever. It took some doing, but you did it. Let's go back to the beginning. It might be a good thing to sum it all up. Most of you were civilians when this thing started. Truck drivers, painters, riveters, clerks, teachers, students, actors, everything in the book. But no matter what you'd been before, in due time, you became sailors. And by and large, most of you adapted yourselves, whether stateside or in forward areas. And when the time came, you did a good job. There were bad times. And there were good times. Sometimes the food was good. Sometimes it wasn't so good. There were those uniforms, apparently designed by a guy who thought it was immoral to carry anything concealed in your pockets. There were restrictions. There were those inspections. And there was loneliness sometimes. those watches that seemed so long that you wondered if you'd ever done anything but stand watch. And there was that chief you swore you were going to kill someday. And that J.G. who was a pain in the duff.
serious things, things that count. There were those guys who were hurt. There were those guys who were gone for good, some of the best. No man can deny that this victory has been won at great cost. What did we get out of this useless war? Nothing but taxes, debt, and Bolshevism. And the time will surely come when someone will try to persuade you that this victory, your victory, was not worth the cost. When that time comes, it might be well to remember what defeat would have meant to you, to your families, to your children, born and unborn. Here is the record. Here is history, as your enemy succeeded in writing it for millions of others. This is history as they would have written it for you if you had not prevented them. This would have been America, but for you and your comrades in arms. These are some of the millions of children who've looked on defeat. Children now in rags and in tears, without food, without laughter, grown old without youth. Never believe that the people of this nation are not grateful to you for having kept such tragedy away from this land. Never believe that these, your people, are not moved at the thought of what you have done. Some there will be who will not have the power to utter their gratitude for what you have done, because such gratitude is unutterable. But the feeling is there, sailor. The feeling is in the hearts of the mothers of America, whose children you've spared from hunger and terror and death. It is in the hearts of all those who came to these shores to seek a freer, fuller life. It is in the hearts of those who fought before you to preserve the precious birthright that you once again have saved. It is firm in the hearts of children who think you're the greatest bunch of guys ever. It is in the hearts of all those who have given their sons in battle. It is in the hearts of all those who love this land of ours. And sailor, that's just about everybody. And it is in your own hearts as well. For you have good cause to be grateful to yourselves for having kept this land, this way of life, intact. Look at this land, sailor, this way of life. These are our villages. Our towns. Our cities. This is our history, of which you have written the latest bright chapter. This is the tale of our struggle for liberty. people at work. And at worship. These are our people at leisure. This is our art, our sculpture, our music. A penny for a spool of thread, a penny for a needle, that's the way my money goes. This is our age-old custom 
of governing ourselves in free assembly, where every man can speak his mind without fear and without restraint. They should be snowed up for six months in the year. And I tell you that if Ken Higgins won't get us snow fences, I say we ought to elect someone who will. These are some of the things that add up to a way of life that we rightly judge to be the best we know. These things you fought for. These things you shall keep. This is a way of life that we may alter, but that we shall alter for the better and after our own fashion. Secretary of the Navy. I salute the men and the women of the Navy. You have completed your mission. You have taken part in the winning of the bitterest war in history. You have carried out this mission in a manner which has earned you the respect and the gratitude of the entire nation. Now your service in that Navy draws to a close. The readjustments as you return to civil life may be difficult for some of you. But as you adjusted yourselves to the ways of war with a speed and an efficiency that our enemies thought beyond our power, so too I am confident that you will adjust yourselves to the ways of peace. All hands stand ready to help you who have served this country so well. As the Secretary of your Navy, I bid you goodbye and say, well done. As your fellow citizen, I welcome you home to live in peace among your own people.